I'm very excited today. Welcome to Going the Distance, the Rocky Series podcast. I'm very excited today to have Derek the Wayne Johnson. <laughs> it's, this is your fourth appearance, Derek, on the show. Fourth, but I think it's like only my third with video, right? Yeah, I th- no, the f- maybe three. Well, the first one was video, but it was we had all these issues, and then I think we did audio. And then video, video. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, no, good, good memory. Boy, look at you. Well, we always have technical problems, you and I. <laughs> I. I don't know why that is. Maybe we'll do okay today. I'm really excited to have you on today because we're going to kind of put a, a cap, a finality to your Stallone adventure because the whole reason why you and I met and have become, I would say, friends because of Mr. Sylvester Stallone and his Rocky franchise and him as a movie maker, uh, you as a movie maker, how your world's connected. So if this is the first time you're listening to Derek and I talk, I'd recommend going back to all the other interviews and hearing all the stories of Derek's journey because we don't need to rehash out everything. Not that it's not important, but this is more of the the final chapter on your journey with the Rocky series and Stallone. And we're going to start off by talking about the documentary that you edited for Stallone, the behind the scenes of his recut or his own editing of the Rocky IV, Rocky versus Drago recut. How did he get a hold of you? Was it John that got a hold of you or was it Sly that got a hold of you for the editing? It was Sly. He uh, he FaceTimed me, which was pretty cool. And um, <laughs> Oh, yeah. He- <laughs> Sorry, can't we just... <laughs> This, okay, I, I okay. I just want to say this. I know it's for you, like, and I'm not going to speak for you in, in, uh, in a terrible way. But you're like, all right, fine, Sly, I'll do it for you. It's a uh, crazy uh, that he has you on Facetime, and I, I can only imagine. I'd be like, oh, hey, honey, uh, can you just give me a second? Uh, Sly's got me on Facetime. <laughs> Is this the way, the casual way? Oh, he Facetimed me. Okay, sorry. Yeah, go on. He Facetimed you. <laughs> Well, that was the first time he FaceTimed me, but... Anyway. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, no, this, it, it's true, though. There's a two-part FaceTime story to this story. No, he just, he FaceTimed me. I mean, we usually talk on the phone or text or email or whatever. I mean, I didn't expect him to FaceTime me, but he FaceTimed me, and he was, if I remember correctly, this time he was on the way to the airport to fly out to Atlanta, to do Samaritan on this particular one. Now I did an interview recently and I have to correct myself. I got the two FaceTimes mixed up. So that was the first FaceTime. And he asked me, you know, this is what I have. John Hertzfeld, iPhone, would you edit it? Da, 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 da. And, I, and I knew John cause John was in still and Frank that is, and he's a friend. So it was like pff, no brainer. So that was the first FaceTime. Then John called. And we FaceTimed because he was so excited that I said yes, because Sly called him and he called me. You know, it's just like all three of us, we were the only three that knew about this. So it was like we were all excited. So then, like, I don't know, a week or two later, Sly FaceTimed me again, this time from the set of Samaritan. I think he was in his dressing room or whatever, hanging out. And we talked about it again. So it was just funny because it was like, A, yeah, I'll do it. I did make a joke to him about, you know, it's more Rocky stuff for me, huh? Because we've done, you know, the three documentaries before that. This was the fourth. It was kind of, it was just funny. It was like, John was like a little kid. He was so excited. Sly was like a little kid. And I'm just sitting there with my mind exploding going, not only is this, you know, Sly FaceTiming me, but he's hiring me to do something that no one's going to know about for about a year. You torched me for a year. I want to make this clear to our listeners. So Derek and I have uh, – we've become friends. Derek is – was it sadomasochal? You know, what is it? You like to inflict – You like I hate that word. You like to inflict pain on people. So Derek sent me a message. He goes, oh, uh, you won't believe it. Uh, Sly just uh, – he just called me and uh, I've got some exciting news. And I'm like, oh, that's great. What are you doing? Well, I can't tell you. But you're going to love it. I'm like, what are you doing to me, man? And then he says, <laughs> so I would, I peppered you. So come on. Is it the, and we knew at the time that he was working on a recut at the time. So I'm like, you're working on something with a recut. No, can't say. I'm like, you're working on something about behind the scenes or some sort of extras for the DVD. No, can't say, but you'll like it. You'll love it. Anyways, you tortured me. I don't know why you do that. Why do you do that to me? <laughs> I don't know. I guess, isn't it sadist? Is sadist. Yeah, word? I think yeah. so. I knew that you would get a kick out of being teased about it, but I didn't know it was going to take a year because, I mean, I worked on that for five months. Right. It took five months to edit that between 
Sly and John and I going back and forth. And it was kind of funny, but I also didn't know that Rocky Drago would come out a year later either. Mm. So like I was teasing you just to tease you. I thought it would last a couple of months. It lasted a year. So sorry about that. That's okay. I forgive you. I forgive you. <laughs> uh, how much footage got cut from this? Like how much footage did you have hours wise? Man, well, hats off to John Hertzfeld because he filmed so much. I mean, how much got cut? Well, it's a 90, 93 minute documentary. I had, I probably went through several hours. I really don't know. I'd have to check the hard drive, but several hours that John filmed. What was the direction from Sly? What was his direction on your editing? For example, let's say he said something that he didn't want to reveal. So what was the direction on what you can and can't cut? I mean, did you leave things in that he wanted taken out? Was was there anything revealing? that I know you can't share it, but was there something that's like, oh, I don't want that out? I like to protect Sly, right? I would protect any subject. Now, again, I'm just the editor on this. I'm not the director. I'm executing John's vision. But because I've done this several times before, I really take care of my subjects. With Sly, he was so raw and open. John and I really were like, hey, I th- I, okay, I'll put it this way. I think I was a little too protective. And I think John was like, no, 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 let it go. And so Sly was cool with that. I mean, yeah, there's a few things that you like don't put in. I got to give them credit that they're like, no, 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 don't hold back unless instructed otherwise. So yeah, a few things, but for example, um, I mean, I can't say what those little things are. That would be, you know, that wouldn't be cool, but it was just like, I'd be like, okay, I'd say I'd do this cut and it'd be like, say 30 seconds. John would be like, no, 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 let it breathe, make it a minute. And I thought that was very interesting because it wasn't my style. And if you, if you look at this documentary, you can tell it's not my style. What you can tell, because again, I'm just the editor. What you can tell is you can see similarities from my other documentaries that I did editorially, but this was John's let it breathe style as opposed to my boom, 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 boom style. Now, did you add the photos, the photos that were inserted? We got a lot of, yeah. Was it your creative decision? Yeah. yeah. All the photos, all of the film clips. I knew it. I was like, I was watching. I was like, I think that's Derek. I think that's Derek's touch. I think that's him adding that sentimental pictures and what have you. Yeah. Even the music. I mean, some of it John chose. uh, Well, hold on. I should correct myself. What's on YouTube has no music. Right. But we did a cut with music. um, So they're working all that out. I don't know what's going to come of that. But so I should take that back. But yeah, the film clips, the photos, all that stuff. That was that was me. But some stuff, again, John's the director. He would right. send me something to add in or Sly would like, for example, I remember um, when it's talking about Sly going to the theater and seeing Hercules and, and whatnot. I Googled photos of that theater and put them in and Sly was really touched by that. Oh, nice. He was like, wow, because it's like he was in it again as a kid. He hadn't seen the inside of that theater in a while. Oh, wow, it's really cool. That's awesome. I love that insight. We got a couple of listener questions. Well, actually, not listener questions. Uh, Craig from the Slycast podcast, we were doing a recording yesterday talking about the documentary. And he says, oh, can you ask Derek a couple questions for me? So, are you ready? He sure. wants He wants to know, how long did Sly and John actually work in that studio? How, was it days, months, weeks? Like, how long were they actually physically doing that stuff in that studio? It wasn't really indicated in the uh, documentary. It sort of is. If you remember, it opens with, I think it says September 2020. Right. Okay, yeah, And then right. January 2021. So they spent weeks. It was weeks, um, a couple months. Now, he didn't go straight from September to January. It was like a chunk here, go to Samaritan, and then he came back and did some more. It was weeks to months for sure. Okay. All right. Good to know. What was the lollipop that Sly keeps sucking on? What is that? We were trying to figure it out. Yeah, I can't remember. Uh, I mean, obviously, I, I have the raw footage somewhere. But, yeah, he just – I don't remember if they were provided or what. But it was <laughs> cool to see him. Eating uh, sugar. John, Eating sugar, yeah. Sly. Come on. I thought <laughs> – or, or, or maybe sugar-free. I it don't know. It could be sugar-free, yeah. But, yeah, he uh, – John 
you know, to John's credit, he was like, yeah, make sure you got to put that in there. So, okay. Well, cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's the first thing I was like, what is that lollipop? I was driving me crazy. Not that he was uh, eating it, but I wanted to know what flavor or what, what the product was and uh, maybe give a shout out to that product. How was the movie delivered to the final product delivered to you and Sly? Like we noticed on the documentary, he said, you know, the property of MGM that has Sylvester Stallone's name on it to show this is his copy. I mean, who who delivered that copy to Sly at the end for him to view in his home? And I, we assume that is his home studio at the end of the film there? Oh, of, of the actual movie. Sometimes I get the movie and the documentary mixed up. What was he watching at the end? Yeah, he was watching the movie at the end, right? Yeah, uh, yeah he yeah. was watching the movie back in January. So, so who, that's how long this was, yeah. was existed. So, um, yeah, who, who delevered that? Yeah, who well, that would be – that's MGM. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so the studio uh, delivered that to him and – and that's the same screening room that I've watched, you know, other stuff with him. Right. And that was, that's pretty, we watched my first documentary in that screening room. You watched Rocky, the first Rocky film with Sly in that room, correct? In that room, I have watched John G. Albertson, King of the Underdogs, my first documentary. I've watched Rocky. I've watched, I remember we caught the ending of First Blood on AMC, I think it was. And he gave me a bunch of. Now, when we watched Rocky, though, it was more of a skim through on Netflix, and he was just giving me stories. So, yeah, I've watched First Blood, Rocky, King of the Underdogs there, and then his other screening room, we watched Stallone Frank, that is. Oh, and duh, that's the room where we recorded his narration for 40 Years of Rocky. Okay, oh, I'm boy. Done. Okay, well, no. Well, actually, speaking of maybe being done, you have pretty much – this is it. This is it with the uh... – the Rocky, at least Rocky and Sly, this has to be kind of the final chapter? What do you think? What, as far as you can tell? I mean, maybe it's like Friday the 13th, the <laughs> final chapter. Maybe there will be a new beginning. Rocky lives. I don't know. I mean, I did King of the Underdogs. I didn't know anything about 40 Years of Rocky. Sly offered me that. Then Stallone Frank, that is, happened. And then FaceTime, and it's like, will you edit this documentary? So I don't know. I mean, I don't. I personally don't have any... Um, other Rocky type documentaries in my head floating around that I'm going to do, but I certainly probably wouldn't say no. However, critics uh, are kind of, you know, Derek Johnson needs to get out of the Rocky vortex, but it's like, Hey man, you say he's like, it's fun. It's awesome. I, I'm having a good time, but I don't have any aspirations yeah. like, it's, unless I do a feature. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. So Sly, if you're listening, uh, Derek's looking to uh, direct Rocky Seven. Give it to give there it. There you me. go, man. That'd be amazing. Well, there's nothing wrong. With, I hate the term pigeonhole isn't the right word. I mean, look at Sly himself. I mean, you bring up Sylvester Stallone. What's the first film people think of the, or franchise? Rocky, and then maybe Rambo. It's okay to be known by something that started you or got you into the uh, ethos. I mean, I'm kind of pigeonholed with my little stupid po- <laughs> podcast, and you know, but it's okay to be uh, it's something that starts the journey. And uh, your journey has been kickstarted, or at least you've have gained lessons learned and and you've grown and contacts and now you're you are branching now you are doing which i know you've said you want to do you want to be a feature filmmaker you want to go beyond these documentaries you don't want to be known as a documentary filmmaker so you're working on something right now do you want to talk about your current projects you're working on and what's for the future for derek sure and and i and i Again, to that point, I'm clearly thankful and having a blast doing these documentaries. Of course. Sly asked me to do something again. Of course, I would say yes. Of course. I just don't have personal aspirations. Yeah, I understand. Your your yeah. the, the vision your your personal creativity for that part of the of filming is it's done. But if Sly, yeah, I did I did my part. But if I got an offer, yeah, of course. <laughs> Um, turn down so, Sly. Who, tur- with- who turns down Sly? No, I'm I'm good. Right, right. Same thing with Karate Kid. Like if of course. Cobra Kai, like of course. So I've done four feature films and I just did my fifth, but I haven't done a feature film in like 10 years. So I started doing feature films, got into documentaries. And again, I didn't want to be pigeonholed, but I started to become pigeonholed. I've even had studio executives and big producers saying, well, how do I know that you can do feature films if you I see you doing these documentaries that all kind of feel the same? I'm like, well, here's my demo reel. I'm not going to show you the movies I did 10 years ago because I've come a long way. They want to see something current, right? So with that, I was like, okay, after I edited the making of Rocky versus Drago, I said, it's time to do a feature. There's no better time right now during a pandemic. Kidding. 
to do a feature. So we did a film called Bloodstreams, and it's a feature film. It's a drama, thriller, crime, and we shot it this past summer, and we're almost finished with post-production. So that was really, it was a palate cleanser, and it got me back into what I'm really passionate about. And then it also, at the same time, like I miss documentaries as well. I like the balance, and I think that's what I want to do with my career. Do a feature here, do a documentary there, but I'm back in the narrative feature game right now. And Bloodstreams is a film that you wrote as well? I co-wrote it with my writing partner, Frank Mangarelli. He's in Chicago. We're just good buddies. We see eye to eye on on cinema. So I came up with the idea to shoot a movie. We wrote a script together, and then I directed it, produced it with my team. I'm editing it right now. My longtime film composer, Greg Sims, who did the music for all of those documentaries, he's doing the music. It's, it's really cool. It, it's a far different than the documentaries that I've been doing the past 10 years. Can you give us a plot line? I know you don't like to reveal too, too much. I mean, is there... It, it is too early to kind of promote Bloodstreams, but okay. I will just say that it's a, it takes place in about 24 hours. It's a crime thriller. It's just really cool. It's all set in my home state of Texas. Not the Texas that you always see in movies where there's like a tumbleweed and like a cactus out in the West. No, no, no. East Texas, where it's just piney woods. It's just a forest of pine trees. So it's really cool. It stars Han Soto. He did some Cobra Kai work. Uh, Yuji Okamoto, who from Karate Kid 2 and Cobra Kai. Brad Maul, who was a soap star for 20 years on General Hospital. And then Holland Haley, who you haven't heard of. But you will. She's fantastic. It's a pretty cool East Texas crime thriller. Oh, man. Well, that's that's great. You've t- I mean, you know I'm going to watch it. You know I'm going to buy it. I've purchased everything you've done so far since uh, we've met. I'm looking forward to it. What's next then for you after this work is done? I mean, do you have a project rolling around your head already? Is those, Are those creative juices flowing right now for you? Well, the, yeah. I mean, they never stop. I, we actually want to turn Bloodstreams into a trilogy. Ah, I, was, I, was, so, should have, I should have asked. I was like, is this something that can have a... Okay. Yeah, uh, we definitely have aspirations for a trilogy. And then I have other features, other documentaries. I've just turned down a few. I turned down a feature and I turned down a documentary. So it's like, that's a good you know, issue to have. So yeah, those are nice problems there. to have, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Totally... Totally. Can you say which uh, not which company, but can you say the documentary topic that you turned down or no? Uh, no, I shouldn't because okay. I just you know I don't want it to. All right. It, yeah, yeah, that, it might look bad on me later. <laughs> I'll ask you offline. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I want to know, but if you can't say it, that's fine. Uh, no, I'm just kind of curious. What did what did Derek turn down? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Can tuna making in uh, Central Europe, <laughs> Central Europe, or something? Who knows? Hey, that's something I could get behind. Yeah. Well, documentaries are very interesting because if a, a good documentary. You know a, a documentary is good, sorry, when it's a topic you don't even know anything about or I might have an interest in, but when you watch the documentary, you're like, oh, I enjoyed learning something from that documentary. So I think even people who don't know John G. Appleton as a person, I think if they watch that King of the Underdogs, they're like, oh, he's a fascinating person, you know, even if they've maybe never seen a film that he's done before. That's a, that's a sign of a good documentary is do I find the topic interesting or is it being presented in an interesting way? Well, thank you. And that's kind of the idea – for that one. And then, of course, Frank Stallone. It's like, you know, his brother, who's this guy? But it's interesting. I, I believe I haven't seen it yet, but the Robert Stigwood documentary just came out on HBO Max and he produced Saturday Night Fever and fired John Abelson. So I heard that we hear their side of the story. Of course, oh. my documentary has John's side of the story, sure. but the truth is in the middle, I'm sure. It always but is. I'm, yeah. Yeah. It's cool. It's like, like you said, Taking a subject that you don't know a whole lot about, learning about it, that's what's fun. But even with feature films, I try to think of like, okay, so crime, drama, thrillers, they've been done to death. How can we do it differently? And I think with Bloodstreams, you'll see how we did it differently, I hope. I hope so, too. Don't don't waste my time, Derek. You got to give me something. Right. (laughs) Right. What are things from the documentary to feature film that you – that you learn from doing documentaries? Because you just said you did the feature films, then you did documentaries, and now you're back to feature. Was there something from the documentary filmmaking that you've now implemented into your feature filmmaking? 
Yeah, I think it's always it's it's both because everyone would always say, oh, with your documentaries, they feel like movies. OK, that's intentional. I'm not I don't know if I truly was successful at that, but I get a lot of that feedback. So must have been successful in making them feel cinematic and feel like a movie. OK, so do you take a documentary feeling and put it into a feature? William Friedkin did in The French Connection. And look how that turned out. Mm-hmm. So I do learn, I would say, probably editorially speaking, I love how documentaries are edited. You cram a lot of information and a lot of visuals into a short amount of time. So I like taking that aspect of it and putting it into a feature film. So, yes, I think it's a balance of both. Take the movie JFK, for example. They won an Oscar for the editing it has that documentary feel because they cram it all in and it's effective. I've learned both sides and I think it makes you a better storyteller and a better filmmaker. Why don't directors in general edit their own films? Is it just a time thing? Cause uh, like how much power does the editor have over the director? Well, it's, it's a time thing. It could be a union thing. It could be a studio thing. So there's a lot of red tape. Why the director- would the director have more power than the editor? Or like, I don't understand how, or do they work hand in hand? They just don't talk about it. The, no, the director has, if it's in their contract, hopefully they have creative control and final cut. At least I do. So, or I, I try to on every project. So basically if it's a union thing, then the director doesn't necessarily, the, the editor doesn't work the, the person that's hired to push those buttons. And the director is there eating Cheetos on the couch Going, do this, do that, do that, do this. So the director does have the power. Okay. Um, you see in in the documentary with Sly, he's in the editing room and he's dictating to his editor. The editor's name was Dove, I believe. Yes, Dove. Do this, 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 and this. So the the director does have the power. So it just sometimes it comes down to a union thing, money, time. Maybe a director just needs to go and go shoot another movie or prep for another movie, and he has an editor he trusts, then he can come in and kind of oversee it. I personally love editing my own stuff, and so did John Avildsen, by the way. He didn't always do it, but he loved it, because I feel like until they tell me I can't, I'm going to, because I like having the control, and I know what I want, so why would I have someone else do it? when I'm just going to tell them how to do it anyway. If I was a director, which I'm not, or if I was a screenwriter, if I was filming my own screenplay, essentially, I know the way I am, I'd I'd be, let's say, control freak, but pass or fail, this is my project. Again, there's a lot of red tape, so it just depends, depends what's in your contract. For example, I was offered a script recently that I didn't like at all. They wanted me to direct it, and I was like, okay, well, I have to give my notes and my opinions, and I would like to edit it. They weren't against me editing it. They just didn't like my notes. Okay, so you wrote it and you don't want to listen to me. Why are you hiring me? You go direct it. There you go. Uh, Yeah. It's weird. You have to, as a writer, you have to let go. Your job is done once that director signs on. But with an editor, it's different. That's not necessarily the case. An editor doesn't go, okay, this is me. No, the director is going to have say over what you edit. Who reaches out to the actors? Is that something you do or do you have someone that does that for Like who's your casting? Well, usually it's me. Usually in my films, I already know the people. So I just, I usually write for or just know who I want ahead of time. I've really never used a casting director. Obviously, as my career grows, the budgets grow, et cetera, I will use a casting director one day, but I've actually never had to. I love casting directors and I know some of them personally, but never had to use them coming into bloodstreams. It was like, I knew exactly who I wanted. There was only one audition in bloodstreams. And that was simply because we wrote a character that we truly didn't have anyone in mind for. And I saw an audition for this actor. He was the only person I saw. And I knew immediately he was right for the role. Now, I told this actor that, and I said, at the risk, you know, actors want to hear this. This is what actors want to hear. They want to hear, yeah, I went through 400 people and you're the one, right? Because then they're like, out of 400 people, I was chosen. 
That's actually not the case. I was so blown away by this guy that he was the first person I saw. And I go, him, I don't even see anyone else. So sometimes that happens too. And that happened in bloodstream. Oh, cool. Very cool story. I love it. I want to uh, do a semi cap off on the Rocky franchise myself. If you were asked by Sly, well, actually, before I get to that final question, that's the final question. Regarding the restoration, because you watched the Rocky versus Drago just recently, and I did too just recently. Would you be willing to share your thoughts on on that film? I want to. I know our listeners, my listeners of my podcast, really love you, Derek. They love your insight. They love your stories. They want to know. I love them too. Yeah, thank you. Oh, they thank you. Yeah, you're one of the f- the favorite guests for sure. They want to know what your thoughts are overall on the uh, director's cut. Yeah, oh, I'd love to talk about it. I know it's a rocky show, and I didn't mean to go off on bloodstreams and stuff. No, but, I, I wanted to talk uh, about bloodstreams. That was me. But, well, thank you. Yes. Thank you. So what are my thoughts on Rocky versus Drago? I loved it. And here's why I loved it. I love that. And normally I don't care for when films get tainted with like classic films, like they mess with them. But again, going back to Lethal Weapon, I love the Lethal Weapon director's cut. And that kind of showed me as a kid, the director's cut came out when I was about 16 in 1999. And that's the one I really watched the most. So it's hard for me to go back and watch the theatrical theatrical cut. However, you take something like Star Wars. Of course, I prefer the original, not the special edition, right? Okay. So I watched Rocky versus Drago, and I'm like, I'm glad this exists. It's such a great companion to the original. I truly feel like I like both of them equally because I laughed in the new one. There were lines in there that I literally went, <sighs> like how I don't want to spoil anything for the audience, but some of Polly's lines were changed when they get to Russia. And I'm like, what? It was neat. And I love how it, it was flushed out a little bit better. It breathed and more Adrian. I was like, yes, give me more Talia any day of the week. So I really liked it. There were some spots in it where the pacing was a little off. But you're going back 35 years, that's going to happen. I really enjoyed it. I love that they both exist. I feel like once a year I could watch each one and be totally satisfied. There's my spiel. Okay, gun to your head. You have, to, right. wa- you have to watch the franchise as a franchise for the rest of your life with one of the two inserted for four. Which one do you pick? Uh, well, I would go with the original. Okay. And the reason is it's in my bloodstreams. Yeah. I have bloodstreams. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one that we all grew up on. But I love that I got to experience yeah. uh, the new one. Really good. I totally agree. Now, uh, we talked about this on our recording last night with Craig, and he wanted to know – well, he asked me, he says, "Did you, you could tell – and this isn't a criticism on the film, but maybe this is a technical thing that you can speak to – is you could kind of tell on the film, because I was watching 4K high def on my TV – and there's times I could tell, oh, this is this is the inserted footage due to the resolution issues. What's the technical reasoning for that? Are they not able to make it a seamless? Is it a money thing or is it just a film transfer thing? Is it just we can't restore that footage to make it look like today's footage? It's all about the master. So they MGM definitely went into the master, which is 35-year-old film, physical film print. It's never going to be the same. Now, some of it... You also have to think about this. So if they go in and and they go into the master, they can make it as pristine as possible, right? This piece of 35-year-old film. But sometimes they don't have the master. Sometimes they have a duplicate. Okay? So you have to think in your mind of VHS tape because we grew up with VHS. We're watching movies now that look like they're brand new, but we saw them snowy with tracking issues and kind of hard to see. That's because that was a duplicate of a duplicate of a duplicate, of et cetera, et cetera. And that fades over time. So take that to film. Sometimes they can't get into the master or they only have a duplicate. Once you have just that, it's hard to match it. It comes down to it's not sloppy editing or anything on MGM's behalf. It's just... This is a physical thing that's old and we're trying our best or we don't have the actual clean version of it. Even with some of the audio, clearly you heard Sly do some ADR, some 
voice. So he put his new voice into some stuff. Yeah. Hey, that's cool. I mean, I know I have the ear for it. Yeah, I could tell. I know which uh, scene you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's cool. It didn't bother me with the sound. Now, you, have to, you also have to remember, for five months, I was watching all of this happen, editing the documentary. So I also have seen stuff that isn't even in the documentary. You know, they had to go in with the sound and redo sound. And how do you match sound? Notice that the punches, the sounds are different things. It's just different technology. Uh, regarding the documentary, back to the documentary, there's one thing that I saw in the documentary that I thought Sly was going to put in the final film. So, it's kind of funny. I watched the documentary first and I was like – because then when I watched the Rocky versus Drago, that part wasn't in the film. Like, Or if it was, I missed it. There's a scene that he was showing in the documentary when Rocky did like a warrior yell at Drago. Rah! You remember that part? Okay. I need to clarify. And when you go back in, watch it again and you'll see – it's not part of the movie. That's his warm up. Yes, they were recording because, you know, you start the camera. That's the, the leader that gets cut out of the movie. That's Sly warming up. That's not Rocky. Oh, that's Sylvester. I just loved it when, it when I saw it. So that was just Sly being Sly. That's Sly being Sly. He's oh. bulking up. He's raging out. The wolf is coming out in him because you have to understand, like, Okay, he's directing, he's acting, he's got to play Rocky, he's got to know exactly what moment he's in. He, he's psyching himself up. So when he says action, he's in the moment because he's, the, he's an athlete, he's a physical guy. So that's literally Sylvester, that is not Rocky. That is so cool. Was that explained? Did I just miss that? Was I just, am I just a, I don't know why I would miss that. Uh, I'll have to go back in and see. I haven't seen the doc in a few months, but... I'm pretty sure it may not be explained. I well, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's okay. I mean, it's like anything, like when you watch something for the first time, you're just going to miss things. That's why you can watch like a movie for the 10th, 13th, 100th time. And you catch things that you just didn't, your brain just catches what it catches. But I just, I saw him doing, I guess I was attacking or approaching the documentary as everything I'm seeing on screen, he's trying to put into the film type thing. So there's part of my brain like, oh, he's going to do this like warrior yell before he starts fighting Drago. That's still very cool. That was like, that wasn't acting. That was just Sly being real. So that's actually kind of more cool. I thought it was Rocky doing it, but it was Sly getting ready to be Rocky. So that's really, really – so again, if you haven't watched this documentary, people, you got to watch this documentary. And, and remember, he talks about the arm wrestling thing. Yeah. That's what he would do. He would get – he would psych himself out, and that's how he beat that bodybuilder back in college, which you see in the documentary or you hear about it. Psyching himself out. That's his way of doing it. That's awesome. The other thing I really liked about the documentary is – they showed bloopers, essentially bloopers that we've never seen. Have we ever seen a Rocky blooper before this documentary? We've never seen any of this stuff. And now, imagine you're me. And imagine it's a year ago. I mean, think about this. I'll, I'm going to set this up for you. No one knows about this. Millions of people are going to see this, but only you know about it. Mm. You, John Hertzfeld, Sylvester Stallone, Dove, the editor, of course, more people at MGM. I'm sitting there going like, whoa this is cool and i can't talk about it so the bloopers again things that behind the scenes stuff things that didn't go in the movie it blew my mind so no we never saw any of that stuff that stuff sat in the vault for 35 years no one saw it and he goes back in and he pulls it out even the way he's messing with Dolph, and he's like off camera he's directing Dolph, get feeding him some lines like here say this say that say it and then he says the whole bit about, and I'd like to thank my manager. Da, 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 da. I mean, that's classic stuff. When are we going to get a blooper reel? Is there a blooper reel? I personally didn't cut one, and I, so I don't know. But it's just cool that that stuff exists. It's yeah, cool that the whole finally correcting that Apollo doesn't have his gloves on. Stuff like that. I mean, it's just great stuff. But that's filmmaking. You, there's mistakes. You know, there's bloopers all the time. Yeah, I love bloopers. And when I saw, when I was watching it, we see Dolph playing Drago, of course, laughing at Sly. You know, he laughed. He broke character and laughed to see Drago smile. It blew me away because I'm watching the Drago footage, but the Drago sort of smiling. Like, oh, yeah, it's just Dolph smiling. So it was, it was just a really cool little moment. So, again, watch this documentary, folks. Are we going to get a physical copy? 
I know everyone keeps asking this question, where is the physical? There are a lot of people who are are not streamers. They want physical copies of Rocky versus Drago and of the documentary. I don't know either. I still, you know, I still talk to Hertzfeld, John Hertzfeld some, and, you know, he'll keep me updated on stuff. But I don't know about the film either. So I really just don't know. I know that that would be great and it should happen. And I'm sure it will. Why wouldn't they? I mean, they they would make a lot of money on both. So I just, I don't know personally, though. I think it was said by Sion in an interview that he's not opposed or maybe even will maybe tinker with some other Rocky films. Do you think he will? I don't know. He hasn't said anything to me, but I'll be glad to uh, edit another documentary for him if, if he does do one. But no, I don't know. Because you have to also think about Say, you know, everyone's like, Rocky Five should be yeah. next. Rocky yeah. Five, you got to fix Rocky Five. Well, that was John Abelson's film. Rightfully so. I mean, it tells you something about Rocky Five, doesn't it? That people are so desperate, not in a, not in a mean way, but they're so desperate for that film to be Sly's vision. Because I know you're a big John Abelson fan, and we know the, the problems with that production. Whose vision was that finally on that film? Was it a, was it a mishmash? Was it just – was it two different directors? Is there a vision that you think exists on film that can be fixed? We've talked about the director's cut before or the, the work print yeah. that was on its way to YouTube years ago. It was so much better than the theatrical version. No, look, John was the director. That was John's film. Sly brought him back. They try to recapture the earlier essence to no avail. I mean, you have studio interruptions. You have worn out material. You have, you know, Sly's version, John's version of each story. And... You know, it all comes down to the script and just the production itself. Sometimes just don't hit. I really enjoyed that direct director's cut slash work print. I only saw it once, but it was like there was a lot of really cool stuff in there that didn't make the final cut. I do know that, and I think I've told you this before, at the end of Rocky Five, when he's fighting Tommy and there's like all this crazy insane editing and like montage and stuff. That was not John. That was to my, from what John told me, that was maybe the studio or the editor did that. And I don't think John was going to put Drago in it again. MGM, please don't be mad at me for saying all that stuff, but that's just what John told me. So now you might go, wait a second. You just said earlier that the director calls the shots. But again, sometimes there's, I don't know what was in John's contract. There's studio involvement. There's there's union stuff. I don't know. All I know is he told me that that wasn't his editing and he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have done that. Yeah, I know it's kind of a messy business because even Sly says in the documentary that he felt some pressure from the studio with Rocky Four that even himself at that stage in his career, I mean, he was only about 40 years old, but he was like feeling the pressure from the studio and he, he kind of felt rushed too, and he felt like he was, he kind of knew he was given that 80s product even back then, that it wasn't quite the drama that he had in mind either. That's kind of what I got from the documentary. I mean, sometimes we speak of re editing, and sometimes we re edit our own memories, right? Like, I don't know if our memories can be kind of false, but he said that that was what he felt at the time, that this was a way of making up for what he wanted at that time. Probably with John, I would assume, I think a lot of the studio did meddle because I think we, I think Sly said he wanted Rocky to die at the end of part five. That was his first vision. But because well, that's why John signed on. John signed on to that project because he read the script and, it, and Rocky dies and Adrian's holding him in, in her arms. And it was this beautiful ending. And then as you find out in my documentary about John, the studio calls is like Rocky doesn't die. Yeah, exactly. So to Sly's credit, I mean, he wrote that beautiful ending in the, in the studio did metal and change that. So, but also to on the Rocky four thing, Sly does talk about the folly of youth and how he wish he would have thought differently back then. So as much as like he may have originally wanted Rocky four to be more of a drama and he had studio pressure he also was young, full of adrenaline, and like, let's go, 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 go. And as he's mellowed out over the years, he's like, could have let this breathe. And he finally got to do that. So I think when you're younger, it's all about go, 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 go. I mean, how many times have you heard from people that aren't true fans like, oh, Rocky 1's boring. It's yeah. so slow. I really love Rocky 4. Yeah. 
That says so much about a person, to be honest with you. Yes. Let's be real. If you're a Rocky fan and you're legit a Rocky fan of the franchise and you say Rocky Four is your favorite film of the franchise, is it fun to watch? Absolutely. Is it a blast? Does it go down easy? Yeah. The only two that I give you uh, arguments for is Rocky One and Rocky Two. They can say it's their favorite. But if you say it's the best. Okay, fine. That's fair. That's fair. Okay. Yeah. If you say Rocky 1 isn't good and it's slow and boring, you have issues, kid. Yeah. Derek being the diplomat, it's, uh, it could be your favorite, but it's not the best one. Perfectly said. Before we close, one last question. If Sly asks you to direct Rocky 7, what is a plot point that you would like to see happen? I have no idea. And I'll tell you, I'm just being honest. Sure. I have no idea because if I think about that stuff, it'll drive me insane because I know I won't be directing it. You see what I'm saying? If it were to happen. If I really just start thinking about it, I'll get excited and I know it's not going to happen. So I just don't think about it. But I will say something on Rambo. Tell me some Rambo because when I'm done the Rocky franchise, which is soon, by the way, we're going to move on to the Rambo franchise as a podcast. So yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Hey, that's pretty cool, man. I'll... Wow. Well, I was just going to say, when I saw Last Blood, you know my thoughts on it. We, I think we talked about it or messaged about it, maybe. What I would have done at the time, Brian Dennehy was still alive. I don't know how his health was, obviously. I would have brought Dennehy back, and I would have made him the Troutman-type character, meaning he's coming back to help whoever be like, I've been there. I've fought this guy. Either he's more like helping in the Troutman sense that Troutman did in part one, or he's, he and Rambo kind of come together in a way. I mean, that's what I would have done. I agree. Full circle with, oh man, his name escapes me. The, uh, his character name. Teasel. Teasel. That's what I would have done, but whatever. But when it comes to Rocky seven, I just, I try not to think. My uh, closer on last blood is very similar. I would have had Rambo caught by the authorities just like he was caught in First Blood, uh, Sheriff Teasel visits him in jail and says, yeah. well, here we are. That's the full circle. Whatever the dialogue would have been, I can't write dialogue, but some sort of like closure. Not an angry visit, but kind of like both broken older men of like the journey's over. They can kind of where it's supposed to be like John Ramble, you know, is kind of a criminal. He's not really supposed to be doing what he's doing on, you know, on Arizona soil. So he does go to jail for the safety of the public and Sheriff Teasel kind of sees him there and says, well, here we are, back to square one. And then just fades to black with them sitting to, sitting in across the bars from each other. Yeah, I, uh, see, I, again, it, you and I just think I die. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Well, you and I can keep talking. People are like, oh, my gosh, guys, hang this up. Already. These two friends are just yapping about stuff. You and I talk forever about the, this sort of thing, and I love it. And I hope our listeners enjoyed it. Uh, Derek is a good friend of the show, a good friend to me, and he's been nothing but gracious with his time, his uh, stories, his insights. You know, for the record, Derek never reveals anything to me that he's not supposed to, for the record. So I just want to make that clear. And I did talk about that in my last podcast, that you uh, you teased me with this, and you never you never broke code. You know, you drove me crazy, but can see why. So I appreciate that. I'm sure the studio appreciates that too. Derek, thank you so much for coming on the show. And I wonder what our fifth interview will be about. I don't know, but I appreciate you always having me on. You're doing good work. I really look forward to the Rambo series that you're going to do. I just want to send a a special thanks to John Hertzfeld and Smith Sloan for bringing me on to the documentary. And to you, Ryan, you're a good buddy. Thanks for having me on. Your listeners are awesome. I really appreciate it. It's a good format to talk. I'll be back, I hope. You will be. All right. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Thank you. All right, buddy.